Hello, hello, hello again. This is Dr. Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. Thanks for watching my videos. And um, here we're going to continue with neurophysiology part C, where we're really going to try to get a better grasp of what the resting membrane potential is that every cell in the body is characterized by. Again, every cell in our body, not just skeletal muscle cells, not just neurons, have a resting membrane potential. What sets muscle cells, not just skeletal muscle cells, but all muscle cells apart, and I should say nerve cells or neurons, what sets these two groups of cells apart from every other cell is that when their resting membrane potential is disturbed, they can become excited. They can now relay information to another part of the body. So let's focus on that some more. So remember in an earlier video, I introduced you to um, a better definition and explanation of potential energy, which I will more often refer to as a potential difference or the voltage across the cell membrane, right? And it's due to the fact that the cell membrane is a type of boundary that keeps opposite charged particles separated most of the time. Of course, there's also the ion channels that then result in kinetic energy. But um, when we try to actually measure that potential energy, that voltage difference, that potential difference across the cell membrane in millivolts, we're now recording our resting membrane potential. Now, that, that difference in, or I should say that, that that value of our resting membrane potential results from two components, and that is an electrical gradient. Maybe the, the inside of our cell is going to be more negative compared to the outside of the cell membrane, but we also have a concentration gradient in addition to that electrical gradient because we don't have all the charges distributed across the cell membrane, but we also have the actual particles associated with those charges, and they are going to have a concentration gradient, often referred to as the chemical gradient. So once again, a resting membrane potential consists or is, is as results, I should say, um, from an electrical gradient plus a concentration gradient. And those two combined, therefore, we can say create an electrochemical gradient, which is really another way of saying the same thing as resting membrane potential. So electrochemical gradient is is essentially a synonym for resting membrane potential. And that resting membrane potential or electrochemical gradient is expressed in millivolts, all right? Now, all cells, all cells are characterized by a resting membrane potential. Every cell in our body has a resting membrane potential, but only nerve cells, also called neurons, or all muscle cells have the ability of having that resting membrane potential disturbed to where they can now generate graded potentials, which could summate and then result in action potentials. And when we have action potentials, we now have an electrical event that can very quickly send information from one part of the body to another part of the body along axons, okay? So the only excitable cells, the only cells in our body that can become excited or stimulated or depolarized, those are all synonyms, are um, neurons or nerve cells and muscle cells. Only, right? So researchers literally stick a little electrode uh, 
in a cell membrane. So here, notice that this is your phospholipid bilayer. Hope you recognize this. Here is the inside of our cell. This is intracellular, where you have your cytosol and the organelles, together referred to as the cytoplasm. And here we have our extracellular fluid. So we can literally stick in a little electrode and then measure the difference, the charge difference, and express that in millivolts. In neurons, what we find is that when we stick a little electrode in the membrane of an axon or, uh, um, um, I'm sorry, um, dendrites or the cell body and everything is at rest. In other words, we're not depolarizing, getting anything excited. Everything is at rest. We find that most neurons on average are going to have a resting membrane potential of approximately minus 70 millivolts. Now, that minus is very important because the way we record the voltage difference or that potential energy when a cell is at rest is by comparing the inside to the outside of the cell membrane. And so the inside to the outside. The inside of a cell membrane is at rest. At rest is always going to be no more negative compared to the outside. Now, this picture is misleading. It gives us the impression that there are only negative charges on the inside of our cell membrane and only positive charges on the outside of the cell membrane. That is not the case. So if we identify individual particles, we would see that there are positive and negative ions here and positive and negative ions on the inside of the cell membrane. So let's go to the next slide now. So by now you have all of your, all of your ion concentrations memorized for sodium, potassium, calcium, and chloride. And they ha don't have calcium listed here. You could add those. Um, but what they have added here is, for instance, amino acids, which are most often negatively charged. There are also phosphate ions. Um, perhaps we could add those. Um, there are sulfate ions and they're all and more and they're all negatively charged. So it's the distribution of these positive and negative charges across the cell membrane that dictates our resting membrane potential. So if we look at the distribution of our positive and negatively charged ions on the inside of the cell membrane versus the distribution of our positive and negative ions on the outside of our cell membrane, we see that the majority of the charged particles closest to the inside of the cell membrane tend to be negative. Are there positive ones? Yes, but the majority of them, or I should say the negative ones outnumber the positive ones. Just nearby the cell membrane, similar principle on the outside. So nearby the cell membrane, we primarily see positive ions. If we were to look at the whole inside of the cell and literally <laughs> start counting positive and negative charged particles, then the cell on the, as a whole is neutral but close to the cell membrane, we see an unequal distribution. And that is what creates that potential difference. Uh, that's what creates our voltage. And as I've mentioned before, for neurons, on average, this, the resting membrane potential will be about minus 70 millivolts. Um, for skeletal muscle, it is about minus 90. So neurons, if we do the RMP for neurons, a little n for neurons would be minus 70. Don't forget the minus, very important because it implies that the inside is more negative compared to the outside. If we do the resting membrane potential for, let's say, skeletal muscle, it would be approximately minus 90. All right, so it sort of depends on what cell we're looking at. Okay, so we now have a better understanding of how we can measure the resting membrane potential in a cell, what it means that 
when ions are unequally distributed along the cell membrane at rest. But let's take a look now at what generates this resting membrane potential. And it all has to do with mostly sodium and potassium. Those are your primary ions that impact the resting membrane potential. Am I saying that none of the other ions that we saw in the previous slide plus more um, can, can impact the resting membrane potential? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that these are the two primary ones. And the thing is that these all of these ions don't leak in and out of our cell membrane at the same equal rate. That's redundant, same and equal. But there, you know, for instance, if we compare sodium and potassium, we see that there are many more leakage channels for potassium. And therefore, potassium will just leak out left and right out of the cell throughout its through its leakage channels and take with it all of its positive charges. Right, so we're losing all these positive charges, but we're gaining some because sodium leaks in as well, but not as fast. So we're losing many more positive charges than we are gaining positive charges. And that's what creates or sets up that more negative inside compared to the outside of a cell membrane. Again, don't forget, we have all kinds of ions on the inside of our cell membrane, not just sodium, potassium, and not just positive, uh, not only negative ions. We have positive and negative ions here, positive and negative ions there. Um, if you forgot about that, back up in the video a little bit more where I just explained that. It's just that when we look right across our cell membrane, the majority of ions will be negative on the inside, the majority of ions will be positive on the outside. All right, so this sets up that um, that that voltage difference across the cell membrane. Now, one thing that we have to ask ourselves is, gee, if this goes on for a while, aren't we going to lose way too much potassium and gain way too much sodium to where eventually this resting membrane potential is totally messed up. We will have perhaps way too many positive charges on the outside compared to the inside. Well, that doesn't happen because we have something that maintains the resting membrane potential such that potassium can continue to leak out and sodium can continue to leak in at different rates, but they can continue to leak along their concentration gradient. So what is our next question? Our next question to ask is what maintains the resting membrane potential? And the answer is the sodium potassium pump. Let's take a look. So in this diagram, we're looking at a fancier picture of the, the cell membrane. So here's your phospholipid bilayer. Here are your various ion channels. These are leakage channels, the ones on the either ends. And then the purple one here is our ion pump. Leakage channels are going to allow for passive transport of our ions, meaning they move along their concentration gradients. Potassium easily leaks out, sodium easily leaks in, they're following their concentration gradients. Remember, we tend to have many more leakage channels for potassium, which is what allows for the setup of the resting membrane potential. But as mentioned a moment ago, how is it that we're not going to run out of the, of potassium ions leaking out of our cell or, or running, running out of sodium ions leaking into the cell. That's maybe a bit of an ex exaggeration, but still, what is going to make sure that we don't lose our concentration gradients, right? Because our resting membrane potential depends on an electrical gradient as well as a concentration gradient. And if we lose um, our concentration gradient, then we also lose our resting membrane potential. And if we don't have a resting membrane potential, that can then not eventually lead to graded potentials, which could potentially become action potentials. I shouldn't even use the term potentially, which could possibly become action potentials. Do you see where we're going with this? So the sodium potassium pump, of course, pumps ions against their concentration. And therefore, your sodium potassium pump which is always going, it's always pumping in all of your cells. All of your cell membranes have sodium potassium pumps. 
those pumps are always going, they're always trying to fix the concentration gradients. That is their main job, to fix and to maintain those concentration gradients. So what are the two questions we addressed here in this video? We asked ourselves, what creates that resting membrane potential to where we have at rest a more uh, negative charge on the inside of our cell membranes compared to the outside? So we addressed that by saying, well, we have many more leakage channels for potassium than sodium. And so therefore we end up with a more negative inside compared to the outside of the cell membrane. But how do we make sure that we do not disturb the concentration gradients too, too much by losing or gaining all these positive ions in the form of potassium and sodium. Well, that's where the sodium potassium pump comes in. The sodium potassium pump fixes and maintains the ion concentration gradients for sodium and potassium. Very, very important to remember that. So there are various stimuli that can disturb a resting membrane potential. And remember, a resting membrane potential is the, the voltage difference for a cell at rest. It's expressed in millivolts, right? And for a neuron, it is usually um, around minus 70 millivolts. Another way of expressing that a cell is at rest is to say that it is polarized. Just want to make sure that you remember these words, or if you missed them, I'm telling you now. So a cell at rest is said to be polarized because the inside tends to be more negative compared to the outside of the cell membrane. Now, many, many stimuli can disturb the resting membrane potential of an excitable cell. And remember, excitable cells include neurons and uh, muscle cells. And the beginning of most neurons are receptors. There are also specialized sensory receptors. We will learn about this more. You know, we're, we're going to sort of throw them in with our nerve cells for the moment. Um, but all of these receptors, neurons, can can experience a a um, a change in their resting membrane potential when some kind of a, a stimulus occurs. Now, in our muscle cells and in our neurons, very often the stimulus is a chemical stimulus in the form of a neurotransmitter. Sometimes hormones, by the way. Sometimes hormones. In our um, sensory receptors, especially like in our special sensory receptors in our head, you know, some aroma, coffee, cologne in the air will trigger our olfactory receptors. My voice triggers your hearing receptors and your ears. You know, all of your special sensory receptors, they're all in your head. Your taste receptors, your sensory receptors for smell, hearing, vision. Uh, even your balance receptors. But you have many additional receptors, which we do, do not call special receptors. They're simple receptors. Structurally, they're much simpler, such as your touch receptors, your pressure receptors, pain receptors, thermal receptors, mechanical receptors, on and on. Um, they are much simpler, and they're located in different parts of the body. But still, they also can respond to chemical stimuli. Let's say the the chemical receptors in your in your stomach they will detect changes in pH for instance um, but not all of them are going to respond to chemical stimuli for instance the pressure receptors in your body are going to detect changes in pressure they're not going to respond to um, uh, some kind of a change in the chemical environment right and and your um, um, pain receptors will are going to respond to pain or uh, thermal receptors respond to changes in temperature. So you see how all of these different receptors in the body um, are going to have their own specific stimulus, stimulus in most cases. Now, all of those stimuli I just mentioned are going to generate some kind of a graded potential. And we will learn a whole lot more about graded potential.
The only thing that can create action potentials is a threshold voltage. So a serious change in the resting membrane potential is going to then trigger uh, an action potential. So we now understand what the causes are of a, a disturbance in the resting membrane potential, but what are the consequences? So, so let's figure this out real quick, and, and we're going to go into more depth on this later on, but let's say that the resting membrane potential of a typical neuron is, is around minus 70, right, millivolts. Well, if we talk about disturbance by one of these stimuli, that we learned about a minute ago. What really happens as a result of that disturbance? Well, we can either go towards zero in our millivolts or even beyond zero. So in other words, we're going to make the minus 70 more and more positive. So we might go towards minus 60 and eventually all the way to zero or even beyond, right? And this, as you know, we refer to as depolarization. So literally what we're happening, what is happening here is that we're flip-flopping the distribution of our ions across the cell membrane. So in the case of depolarization, the end result is that the inside becomes more positive compared to the outside. So the cell is not polarized anymore, which it is at rest. At rest, the cell is polarized with the inside being more negative compared to the outside. But when we depolarize, we move away D from that polarized state and we literally flip-flop the um, arrangement of our charged particles across the cell membrane. So we go into, or we go more, we, we go into the, more and more into the positive, let's put it that way. Now, a disturbance can also mean that we go more and more into the negative. And we might now go to minus 72 or minus 75. So we're literally polarizing even more than at rest. And this we call hyperpolarization. So either depolarization or hyperpolarization are considered disturbances of the resting membrane potential. Now, why did we never mention hyperpolarization earlier? Well, because hyperpolarization never happens in skeletal muscle cells. It does not happen in skeletal muscle cells. Skeletal muscle cells, when acetylcholine binds to them and they're and plate potential summate, they are always going to be excitatory or depolarizing end plate potentials. There's no hyperpolarization in skeletal muscle cells. The other excitable cells, neurons and their receptors, smooth muscle, um, they can go through uh, hyperpolarization. Cardiac muscle tissue will also stick to depolarization only. Cardiac muscle tissue and skeletal muscle tissue are very alike in their physiology and to some extent in their anatomy as well, as you've already learned. So this is sort of a preview of where we're heading with this, right? We learned what stimuli can trigger disturbance in the resting membrane potential, but now I also explain to you what the consequences are. Now, to reflect on what you learned in muscle physiology, the only way an action potential can be fired is if the electrical disturbance goes in the right direction, and that is by means of depolarization. And, and we also need to reach that threshold voltage for the voltage-gated channels to open, and it's the same in all of the other excitable cells, so keep that in mind. So this slide is a quick synopsis of what I described to you uh, in the previous slide, so that we can talk about a disturbance of a resting membrane potential as either a, where's my symbol I need to use? Here we go, a depolarizing graded potential or a hyperpolarizing graded potential. So these are examples of postsynaptic potentials on, occurring on the postsynaptic membrane, meaning 
posterior to the synapses, right? You can refer to our skeletal muscle cell membrane, that, that uh, motor end plate, as the postsynaptic membrane. But in skeletal muscle, this postsynaptic membrane will always develop a graded potential called an end plate potential, and it is always depolarizing only. So no hyperpolarization happens in skeletal muscle or, as you'll see, in cardiac muscle tissue either. So this wraps up our introduction to um, neurophysiology, and we can now dive deep into graded potentials and action potentials. Thank you very much for watching my videos, and I really hope that they are helpful to you.